Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully, you can hear me at the back today. It seems to have the mics working much better this one. Uh, so, Peter, I hope you're happy. Oh, I'm saying, keep your voice. We have people as well, which is something you just can't please. I'm not lecturing this, of course, you can't hear the audience. Uh, um, okay, welcome uh, to tonight's lecture. Uh, tonight we've got Nick Lay uh, from Connected. Some of you probably will recognise him, others uh, won't. Um, he's going to be talking to us about the uh, future of uh, uh, air test and evaluation. Uh, he's going to look at some what I would call physical flying and um, some simulated uh, uh, activity. So hopefully it should be a really interesting lecture. Nick has been with Connected many, many years. And he's also a graduate of the Empire Test Pilot School as a flight test uh, engineer. So he does know what he's talking about, unlike some of us other genetic that we don't. Um, he's worked on the uh, Joint Strike Fighter, unfortunately, he worked on the Boeing bit for that, so it wasn't successful, but he also really had the aircon thing. I mean, it was. Well, as, as, as the Boeing vice president said to me, he said this airplane was designed to go to war, not a junior prom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen such a new one, but F-35, obviously, uh, we've then done more work at Boston on the uh, various other platforms. He's um, recently been heavily involved in actually moving uh, the Empire Test Pilot School from what was a military-based school, military aircraft, to a civil base. Uh, uh, school using civil aircraft. Uh, those of you know a bit about the ETS, most of the aircraft were on their last legs, been there for many, many years. Whereas now we've probably got the most modern fleet of any uh, test pilot school in the world. Uh, so it's it's really good to see. And obviously the reliability we've got with the okay, that is really good. So we think they touch on that or we may not. Uh, so no more ado, I'm gonna pass over to Nick. Uh, hopefully his mic works as well as this one. Uh, any questions, just feel free to ask at the end. Well, I'll come around with the uh, roving mic so that uh, you can hear me at the back. Uh, and Nick, over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, good evening. And uh, I hope you can help it and you can hear me. Um, and if you can't, please just wave. Um, so thank you very much um, for coming in tonight. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm uh, as, as a uh, as a sideline, I'm the president of the Boston branch, so it's a real pleasure to come and visit a uh, fellow branch and just to share a few thoughts. Uh, uh, the presentation I've got is a connected presentation, uh, perfectly uh, approved for release, but the comments I'll make clearly will be my own um, and uh, therefore shouldn't be described to anyone else. Uh, and although this uh, presentation is very much around uh, how we get technology into the air um, and how we use flying test beds. I will talk a little bit about some of the trends we see in aircraft test and evaluation um, and, and what the digital era, what we sometimes call Industry 4.0, means for us who work uh, in the aerospace sector. So, uh, without further ado, it's always great to have a photo glass, isn't it? And um, I thought I'd really start off with some spotting. So, uh, uh, Paul, um, any ideas on the uh, top left? Skitty Paul? Correct. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, 1903. Uh, Two bottom left. Right. Top left. Two okay, bottom left. Right? I'm sure talking about Bar carrier. Exactly. <laughs> So uh, what, what we've got here uh, are firstly the very first uh, uh, flight test activity, uh of the Wright Brothers, Peter Hawk, 1903, and then some examples of um, where um, in the UK uh, we've done some quite remarkable things um, with some fairly old aircraft. Um, and so I just want to take you around to what, what some of those activities were. These are all um, flying test beds at various descriptions at the top right. Um, hopefully, none of you want to recognize the mighty sneaking. Um, and this was uh, a test activity which we conducted uh, back uh, I must have about 15 years ago now, about 2006 2007, um, where we were looking to um, uh, provide a significant quiz performance. Uh, sneaking, of course, designed uh, for maritime roles 
uh, sea level relatively temperate, or we'll have them in Afghanistan at high altitude at very high temperatures. How could we get more performance out of that spherical aircraft? Uh, and the answer was to um, uh, take advantage of what a US civil operator had done, um, uh, a, 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 an operator called Carton Helicopters, who had um, a, a, a large fleet of civilian seekings that they used for those operations and they wanted to get more performance out of it. And they hired an analysis, a structural engineer, and they developed their own set of main rotor blades. And they made some great claims for performance improvements. Um, so we got a set of these blades, fitted them to that seeking. I uh, fitted uh, a, um, a, a really advanced uh, flight system implementation system, which was based in the, in the rotating rotor hub, actually, at the center of the, of the main rotor blades, uh, and then got to validate Carlton's claims and show that actually we could get more performance out of the seeking, not by upgrading the engine, although we did that as well, uh, but simply by improved main rotor blade aerodynamics, more lift, less drag. Bottom left is uh, what I regard as one of the unsung heroes um, of uh, UK uh, test and evaluation. Uh, because this was, although it doesn't look like it, the genesis of the flight control system in the F-35 Lightning II, which is now the mainstay um, of uh, UK uh, maritime aviation. Um, and this was a program which was looking at how um, could you, in the next generation of short takeoff and vertical landing aircraft, how could you control those aircraft? Because the Harrier was very much built uh, pre, in the pre digital area, let's call it that. And the remarkable thing about the Harrier was to actually enable any human to be able to control vertical flight. Um, it required the top about 20% of the past year air crew to be able to do it, but um, with um, a great deal of training. Um, and three inceptors, so a stick, a throttle, and a nozzle lever, able successfully to transition from windboard flight to vertical flight and vice versa. But now I have digital flight control systems, so I can do whatever I like. Um, I can um, have three inceptors, like the Harriet, so a stick, throttle, and a nozzle lever, or I can have two inceptors. Um, I just have a throttle lever and a go forward, go backward, go up, go down lever. Or we just have one um, and actually have one inceptor and uh, do everything using one, uh, one device. Um, and the beauty of this aircraft was that um, it had uh, a secret weapon. And the secret weapon was called, called the independent monitor. And what that did was make sure that if whatever experimental flight control system you put into the digital computer, if that ever misbehaved, if it got beyond a certain end of bank or certain fixed rate or more rates, the independent monitor would step in, flip off, and you're back to the pilot in the front seat who has a, um, what a minute, I'm trying to wait for that, I'm right. I don't know. So long ago, I can't remember if it's back seat or front seat. I think it's the pilot in the front seat. The pilot in the front seat has just a conventional set of carrier controls. And so all we had to do was prove that that independent monitor, which was developed to safety critical standards, <laughs> always worked under every circumstance. And as long as it always worked, always gripped, and always handed control back to the front uh, pilot to recover the aircraft, then we could put whatever experimental software we liked in the back. Now, that meant that we could fly in the morning, tweak the control walls by the end of the afternoon. Now, the uh, US had a very similar concept here, although they tried to do it in a single seat carrier. Now, the problem with a single seat carrier is you have a safety pilot, which therefore means that the flight control system, the experimental flight control system you're developing, has to be developed at safety control standards and therefore has to be cleared and has the appropriate amount of, of review and, and testing and, and, and certification to make sure that the law must work. Um, and that meant that it flew very, very little and made very, very slow progress compared to what we're able to do with this device. Um, and this was um, the means by which um, that selection of just how many inceptors you would have, and the answer was two, um, and how it would operate, um, uh, and in particular, whether you would needed to have a different set of controls uh, for the vertical aspects compared with conventional fly or not. Um, and that was all developed on that aircraft over the course of the last decade. And then on the uh, bottom right, uh, we have, anybody recognize the other? 
Okay, so that looks like it. Um, and this is uh, going to be radar Charles aircraft. You can see it's uh, landing at Barbara. Um, uh, the important element is what's on the front, uh, which was uh, originally uh, Blue Vixen, and then became the capture radar, which is the Eurofighter Typhoon's airborne intercept radar. Uh, again, um, much of the boat flying uh, from this very site. So that gives you a good example of sort of some of the ways we do. <laughs> We have developed technologies using a variety of different uh, existing aircraft, other than the Wright brothers, um, to introduce new technologies uh, into the airborne environment. And what I'll be talking about tonight is how we might do that in the future. For each one of those was completely bespoke to a particular task, um, and that obviously means that all of the costs of the operation of that aircraft have to be borne by your particular project. Um, and equally, as I'll talk about in a moment, uh, they all have their um, uh, drawbacks as well as their advantages. Um, of course, I, I can't go any further without having that the, the Boston Down, the home of uh, UK tested evaluation. Um, and so I, I've just brought a, a few other um, uh, illustrations of, of some of the things that have gone on there. So the top right, uh, those esteemed gentlemen um, in the back rows, of graduates of the very first course of the Empire Test Pilot School in 1943. They were at the world's first test pilot school, and it's taken just outside um, of the office semester to possibly down. Um, and that was a response to the challenges of the Second World War, which were that um, test, flight testing was very much conducted by experienced pilots. There was no uh, established um, methods by which um, um, they would uh, assess aircraft um, uh, and um, attempt to improve their uh, flying characteristics or their performance or participants in those, in those aircraft. Um, and it was recognized that there needed to be um, a, a firstly a, a rigorous um, uh, and scientific method to use for the evaluation of aircraft in order to be able to get a very best performance out of them. Um, and this is something that uh, needed to be taught. Um, and hence the school which inspired all the other tech pilot schools, whether it be um, at the US Air Force and US Navy tech pilot schools, uh, the French Air Force tech pilot school, the French tech pilot school, uh, ECNA in, in France, or indeed um, the um, Indian Air Force tech pilot school, um, who uh, sent a couple of students in the mid 1970s, took the notes home, and, and formed their own test model at school. And then, bottom right, um, uh, another um, great test asset. This is Spooky. This is the meteorological research flight, um, as you see here um, at uh, Boston Down, probably a good 15 to 20 years ago now. Um, and um, that aircraft actually. Um, although, um, as you see, it's, it's, it's integration there uh, was used for uh, many years um, uh, in support of, of meteorological research, actually ended up being the test fit at Marshalls for the 10,000 horsepower, sharp horsepower, I'd say, turboprop that powers the 800M. Uh, but that's another quite test story because trying to get uh, that 10,000 sharp horsepower engine to uh, maximum power without exceeding any of the flight parameters of the C-130 Hercules uh, was quite um, an exciting dynamic maneuver. So, um, a little bit about actually how we get technology airborne, because it's not just about um, that first prototype. Before you see that shiny jet fighter prototype, there have been an enormous amount of tests being done in advance. And you see here some of the flying test codes I've, I've described the Bark Carrier's role in, in the zones of the F 35. Um, what you see on the right hand side are some of the US variants. Um, at the top right, you see a converted 737. It's the Catbird, that's the Lockheed Martin uh, flying test code that is used to develop systems for the F 35. So it's got, um, if, you, if you use a lot of imagination, you can see that's an F-35 nose in front of that 737. Um, and equally, it's got a whole a bunch of sensors um, mounted on various other parts of the aircraft. Because that was used before the F-35 ever flew to start to develop the avionics, to start to develop sensors, to start to write software 
that formed the backbone of, uh, of that air grant. Um, and if I recall correctly, there were several million lines of software code and flew um, the avionics on that test bed before the F-35 ever flew. Same thing was done um, on an earlier program, so just below that middle right, that is a um, Boeing 757, so stretch of my aircraft recognition um, uh, skills. Uh, that was used in support of the X-22 program, so the US Air Superiority Fighter that was done to, to, uh, uh, to replace the F-15. Uh, and what you actually see there is not only um, a, um, again, it split very hard, and you might recognize the X-22 radio for the cockpit, but just above the cockpit, it's actually the X-22 wing, because um, the F-22 had a great deal of sense to bed in this wing, and it wants to make sure that they could actually they got exposed those to the elements as they would in the aircraft before they'd even flown. In the bottom left and bottom right, you see um, aircraft engine test beds. I've talked about the Challenger flying a, a single dirty with an enormously powerful uh, turboprop attached. Um, what you see on the uh, left hand side there uh, is the Rolls Royce Boeing 747 test bed out in the US. Um, and there you see it's got one sort of the Trent variants. It's the Trent 1000 uh, mounted in the number two position, so that's the left angle position, and see just how much bigger that engine is compared with the original uh, Rolls Royce RB211 uh, that you see in front of it. Um, and again, some really interesting um, maneuvers required because if you want to put that Trent 1000 to full power, you have to at the same time wind all the other engines, three engines back, back to idle and the top of the climb. And it's still a sorry, it's still a parody. Um, rather more, um, rather less of a challenge on the bottom right hand side, you see Frankfurt in Canada um, with a small um, uh, business jet engine mounted on the upper next to the upper deck of their 747. Uh, much less of a challenge there, much less plus. So we've used all of these um, uh, flying test beds to develop technologies such that you avoid. Um, what is the key risk of any test program, which is you start flying with a brand new aircraft, with a brand new engine, with a brand new set of systems, with a brand new avionics, and hardly any of it works first time. So you want to get that technology to at least a reasonable level of maturity before you make that first flight in your shiny new jet. And so this is the means of doing it. But the challenge is, as I said, each one of those are tied to an individual program, an individual aircraft program, or an individual engine program. And, and that means that you've got to bear the entire cost, and the entire cost of running the 747, that not a cheap operation. And so the question we start to ask ourselves um, is, well, how could we afford the same sorts of opportunity to get systems airborne early in their development cycle to start iron out those wrinkles before we got to that shiny new aircraft design? without incurring the vast expense of either having a completely dedicated jet, in the, in the case of the park carrier, or a completely dedicated airliner in the other case. So, what we think about how to do this differently. And another component of this question about how to do tax evaluation differently is, as I said, uh, the introduction of industry 4.0 and the digital world. Um, and that affords us a great opportunity um, to do far more testing in a synthetic environment, in a simulation, as opposed to uh, getting airborne. Um, and that has some great attractions. It's a lot cheaper to develop um, your software code in a virtual environment than to burn kerosene and conduct aviation. Um, uh, it, it's a lot more forgiving of mistakes and errors. Um, and it also affords you the ability to do tests that perhaps you couldn't do or indeed don't want to do in the live environment. Um, so, for example, if you, if you want to uh, work out um, uh, how you can get, I don't know, eight typhoons to cooperate um, and to share information between each other, well, that's a very expensive exercise. If I want to now find eight serviceable typhoon aircraft, get more information at the same time, uh, and do that exercise far more cheap. Uh, a cost effective a way of achieving the same outcome if I just type get eight simulators. But that leads us to some other interesting questions. Because how do I know that, that simulation is sufficiently representative to give me um, a helpful answer 
somebody um, much better qualified than I once said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So, okay, so how do we ensure that our model is um, sufficiently right to be useful? And the answer is, I need to validate. I need to check that that model actually represents real life. Prescriptive means I need to do some prime to check that model. Um, and again, how do I do that on a consecutive basis? So that's um, again a contributing factor to how we might do testing in the future. Much less, potentially much less physical testing with very expensive assets like fast jets. Um, much more testing in the virtual world, but a need to make sure that virtual world does reflect reality sufficiently. I talk about the military side of the house. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about the civil world um, because the same uh, constraints uh, affect us when both um, aviation is saying whether we're connected from military or, or commercial aspects. Um, so, um, talking about um, uh, the commercial world, um, the uh, integration of European um, uh, airworthiness um, authorities. Uh, gave results, uh, uh, or gave the, the formation of what was originally the JAA, the Joint Airworthiness Authorities, and eventually became uh, the European uh, Aviation Safety Authority. Uh, I think it's now actually the EU um, uh, Aviation Safety Authority, which has developed a number of requirements uh, for its design organisations to make sure that they've got. Um, a standard single consistent regime around our flight testing. And what does that actually mean? Well, in the civil world, um, although the military of the world is very much trying to drive towards synthetic testing uh, in order to save time, save money uh, against some very sophisticated requirements, in the civil world, um, uh, and particular ways to try to drive to very, very high levels of safety. There is no substitute for physical testing in the eyes of the regulator. Um, and so what you might do a whole um, um, uh, a whole bunch of virtual tests, but ultimately they have to be a physical test on that basis um, you know, because of the certificate or product. Um, so very much the prudence in the pudding. And, and the challenge with that is that that becomes very, again very expensive. And how can we actually get that physical testing done in as inexpensive a way as possible. And in particular, if we're talking with uh, not just the aircraft manufacturers, but the manufacturers at the second and third tier, so the manufacturers of the boxes that go in aircraft, how can they qualify and certificate their equipment in an affordable way? <clears throat> um, I'll take a slight detail now and talk about some of the Really exciting areas where test and validation is, is developing. Um, and I think there are two aspects which um, uh, I certainly see as, as being at the moment at the forefront and sense a lot of money going into both of these areas um, of, of how we're doing test and evaluation and really interesting new areas. So, bottom right is one of the dozens and dozens of um, new designs aimed at urban air mobility, air taxi, if you will. Uh, and the idea being that clearly the way in which we're going to solve city congestion is by enabling you to have your airborne taxi um, electricity powered, so um, therefore, uh, um, you know, very little away emissions, although don't let that fool you, potentially pretty noisy, um, that will, will, will transport you from any part of the city to a destination, so long as there's a heliport there. And it's no more than about 15 minutes flying time away. After all, this is current backwards that I've been talking about. But there's a huge amount of innovation going on. Lots of small companies. And I don't think you know, I'm probably seeing a whole bunch of quadcopters like this one. Um, um, uh, well, multi-copters uh, with far more uh, rotors than that, and various levels of um, um, converting planes that will, that will transition into into um, conventional flights and back again, as well as a whole bunch of um, sort of uh, um, interestingly configured helicopters. And when you look at them um, and you go, what happens if you hit a bird or what happens if one of your motors fails, you realize there's a long, long way to go for these things all to become certifiable um, uh, and to take off 
operation in the middle of crowded energetic cities. But there's lots of work going on, and that means a lot of testing going on, and again, that needs to get some pretty immature technologies, um, um, like some of the uh, electric motor technologies, like some of the factory management technologies. How can we mature the systems before we put into one of those and uh, can deviation a bit? The second uh, trend that uh, is attracting a lot of uh, work at the moment, and what you see here is representative of a, uh, an exercise uh, on Salisbury Plain that I think some members of the audience have involved with. Um, my date um, is um, an example of uh, what we call, uh, how should we call it, uh, crude, uncrude teaming. We call it manned, unmanned teaming, but these days uh, we want to make sure we can be so That's called crude, uncrude teaming. So, how do I get uh, a crew in that helicopter? Um, to collaborate with um, that and control that uncrewed air system to act as an extension of their eyes and ears, uh, typically um, to provide them with uh, an idea of what's happening over the hill, that age old and the of what's happening over the hill. Um, and um, so that is uh, an area where Kinetic has got some really exciting new technologies that enable us to communicate. Uh, between uh, that manned helicopter and, and that uh, uncrewed air vehicle, and, and to be able to control it and to be able to, um, uh, uh, um, to, to, be able to see through its sensors um, and thereby to give that helicopter crew a better situation in awareness. And that brings us into technologies like autonomy, where um, we're looking to um, rather than have the crew in the helicopter with a little joystick. Physically flying that unmanned air vehicle, that uncrewed air vehicle, what you actually want to do is to tell it what to do. And ideally, say, go over there and look for anything interesting and tell me what you find. That level of instruction, that level of um, autonomous operation. And again, this is something that um, we are getting to the air, air early, as you see, uh, as illustrated by that uh, experimental sort of plane. To try to understand when you do this in the real world, all of the uh, challenges, all of the noise, all of the approximations of real life that you get into the installation. So, a couple of other areas where, again, there's a lot of work going on on the systems. And in fact, swarming drones are something whose first commercial application um, appears to be as a replacement for pilot displays. And you may have seen some of these fantastic um, images of. Light displays um, are the most of the standard complexity, but actually the results of formation flying uh, in some instances dozens of quadcopters, each of which have very lighting, um, to create wonderful displays. Well, that is um, again an illustration of some of the real um, uh, um, applications of autonomous systems and, and swarming. Again, an area of criticism. All of these things are driving us towards wanting to do more testing, to do to get equipment flying, uh, but uh, you might not do that supportably. So how are we looking at doing this? Well, um, what we're trying to do is to create that ability to get airborne uh, and not to have to take all of it, uh, but to have something that uh, everyone can access, um, everyone from an engine manufacturer to an aircraft manufacturer to the manufacturers of, of black boxes. And what we're talking about is airborne technology demonstration, uh, as much as a flying test base. Uh, and what we have therefore started to create um, is that laboratory flying um, that is almost like a, actually, I probably go further that, so it's all about the university side, but the idea is being that, that it isn't just one project or one company that can have that access to it, it's a number of organizations that have access to it. And we've started off by taking one of our uh, Avro RJ, again, some people might recognize this uh, representation, um, uh, and creating in the back of that aircraft um, uh, uh, modularized racks to build all the dynamic equipment, uh, consoles to, to uh, control avionics and interact with those systems, sensors such as uh, radio, um, and a whole bunch of uh, wiring uh, to enable to mount sensors and to be able to provide that. Lab uh, into which you can bring your experiments and fly it in any interesting comfort, um, and therefore, to be able to do so without having to go through a whole certification exercise, 
such that you can mature your systems early on in their development. As I said earlier, I'm sure we can do much of this in, in, in simulation. And I think that, yes, um, we are going to see that. Um, in some of the advanced UK military programs, there's a real push to reduce the amount of live testing, maybe as much as by 90% in aspiration. And so maybe, maybe we will end up with only 10% of the amount of live testing that we have today. But actually, that 10% is likely to be 1% iterated nine or 10 times. Um, because what we, will, what, what we inevitably find is that when you integrate complex systems, um, you know that it might first come. And we need to be, as engineers, we need to be humble and recognize that. Too many times I've been programmed whereby uh, the underpinning assumption is everything will work the first time, or if not, at least very, very shortly after the, the, the assembled that particular system. And uh, trust me, it hardly ever happens like that. Um, and, and therefore, we need to be able to plan for that and to make sure that programs don't fail as a result of needing to iterate. Um, and again, um, that means that we need to, to iterate cheaply and iterate not just in virtual, but iterate live as well. And so it's that, um, I doubt it, that that future of a vastly increased amount of digital um, development and simulation and turning up to a pretty mature standard in that simulation environment but then getting airborne in an affordable way and doing repeated airborne uh, uh, testing to get to that mature system and then be particularly much shiny fast jet. But more than that, actually, um, you can take all the live testing and you can integrate it with the virtual. And so what we're talking about here is not only really take um, that, um, those models in simulation and actually use them to uh, cooperate with some, some live elements of that. So one of the challenges we have in, in modern systems is that they're so complex um, uh, that actually you, you are dealing with what are ultimately systems and orbitals. So you might have um, some of those systems which are developed with sufficient, sufficient maturity that you can put on an aircraft. So let's say we have a sensor on, on, on that, uh, or a real sensor on that aircraft that you're setting, and perhaps we're flying over uh, the English Channel, plenty of targets, plenty of maritime targets, and you're looking at those targets. But what I've developed in the laboratory is perhaps some artificial intelligence technology that I want to be able to use that sensor information but from a real environment and use that to develop my artificial intelligence and my machine learning perhaps. Um, and so therefore, what we're trying to do in terms of developing it is to have that mix of the light and the virtual have an element of your system of systems or an element of your system that's, that's live and generating real world data with all the noise included in it um, and using that to accelerate the development of what you might have in, in a virtual environment. So, I think just to summarize and to bring all these stands together, um, in terms of what we see as um, the future of, of, of test and evaluation, um, is the first element is we need to be adaptable. That means we can't have that situation with the US version of the VAR carrier, whereby you need to re certificate it every time you change the software. It needs to be amenable to that process of fly in the morning, do the software every lunch break, fly in the afternoon, and get those improvements. We also want to make sure that it isn't just about the Boeing, the Lockheed Martins, the ACT of the world that have exclusive access to getting equipment in the air because only they have got the balance sheet strength and the money to be able to do so. Um, we want to work with this to um, start up such that they can get their technology to everyone early. And finally, we also need to make sure um, that we can um, deliver uh, that lab that people require. And that lab and the complexity of that lab is getting ever more challenging. People want more power to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to empower more powerful sensors. Um, they actually want more space to put more the IP on board to see what the fantastic job they're doing, that it's, it's getting travel investment, etc. So we need to have um, a, a, a capability that's got space, it's got power, um, that's um, uh, cheap enough to be available to a much wider audience of the day and it's completely configurable. And that's what we're uh, aiming to achieve. 
And if I go back to uh, where I started from, what we see here is the first flight of uh, um, they want to launch their refrigerator. And as you can see, uh, we're working in close collaboration with VA systems, hence their name above and then into the, into the front door. Um, as uh, we started to develop this capability and develop this laboratory for testing the technologies of the future. So I hope that's been an interesting encounter, not just through um, where Kinetic is going in terms of moving from that fleet of PA store 111 seems to have into what is the future of technology demonstration and product experts, but also a few um, uh, byways into some of the challenges around digital detecting uh, and some of the new technologies that we're also looking at. Um, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Uh, what's going on in that one?